little boys are so different. We sometimes just don't know how to handle him. What is it that the little guy needs from his father and me? How do we help him discover God's purpose for his life? How should we pray for him? How do we not mess this up? Is there any hope we can get this right? Acts chapter 16, one of the leading figures in the New Testament is uh, a man by the name of Timothy. We're first introduced to him here in Acts chapter 16, and uh, we're going to see him playing a prominent role all the way through, through the book uh, of Acts. And then, of course, as he joins Paul's missionary team, uh, he figures prominently in several of Paul's New Testament letters. And, uh, and then we come to here to, um, to, to the New Testament and see that actually two letters are addressed specifically to Timothy. And, and so we have the opportunity to learn from the Scriptures some of the, some of the factors and some of the forces that shaped Timothy's life as he becomes this powerful man that God uses in a remarkable way. I want to begin in Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 1, where it says that Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers of Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, let me just ask you to turn uh, further into the New Testament to 2 Timothy, the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1. If you're not familiar with your Bible, it comes after 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. You know, it's rare that we have the opportunity to not just know something about adult believers and significant people in the New Testament and in the Bible in general, but it's, it's really special when we can see some of, the, some of the things that happened to them in the formative years of their life that shaped them uh, to become the people that God would use in such a remarkable way. And Timothy is one of those. We not only know about his ministry as an adult, but we also get to look back into his childhood and learn some things about him there. Beginning in 2 Timothy chapter 1, notice it says in verse 2, to Timothy, my dear son. Verse 3, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Uh, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Now, the series that uh, I've been in, Home Hope, we've been talking about the hope that we find in the gospel for the marriage relationship, but also the hope that we find in the gospels for the task of parenting. And specifically this morning, I want to talk about what is it that our kids need most what do our boys need most? And what we discover is that the boys need, in, the, in a sense, exactly what the girls need, first and foremost, and that is to find their place in God's great, glorious kingdom purposes. That above everything else, as parents, we have to be passionate about helping our kids find their place in God's great kingdom purposes. Now, now Timothy had a purpose of being a preacher of the gospel, and your sons or daughters may not have that. But the important thing is to help them to discover the unique thing that God is calling them to do, and that is to spread his fame and his name to the nations. On September 3rd of 1939, the King of England, King George VI, made what was probably one of the most important speeches of his life as he prepared the nation to face the looming threat of Nazi Germany under Adolf Hitler, a threat that would become World War II. Those who were closest to the king knew that it was going to be a great challenge for him to make this speech because 
he suffered from a very severe handicap. His handicap was stuttering or stammering. He had, and he would deal with it all of his life. It actually goes all the way back to his, to his childhood where he grew up in a home where there was not a lot of joy. In fact, the day he was born to Queen Victoria was the anniversary of the death of some notable members of the family. So when it came time for his birthday every year, nobody was happy. They were all sad because of the, of the other people that had died on that day. And, and you know how kids are. He, he took this personally. His father was a very stern, overbearing man who had little patience with children. And, of course, this just continued to, to grow this sense of in, inadequacy and, and, in, and, and inferiority in, in George's life. He has this um, nanny by the name of Mrs. Green who was really a terrible, a terrible caretaker. She, she ignored George. Actually, George's brother, remember, was supposed to be the king, and he abdicated the throne. And so everybody doted over his older brother, but they sort of ignored George. Sometimes the nanny would forget to feed him. They made him right with his right hand in spite of the fact that he was naturally inclined to be left-handed. All of his life, George desperately wanted to please his father. But it repeatedly, he was made to understand that he would never be able to do that, would never be able to please his dad. So he comes to his childhood years with this deep sense of, of, of unworthiness. And by the age of eight, he has developed this habit, this handicap of stuttering or stammering. And he would deal with it all of his life. When he came to be the king of England, of course, uh, speaking in public was going to be one of his great responsibilities, particularly in this point in history where the nation needed to be prepared for war. And yet how would he brace them with courage when he was struggling with, with even standing up in front of people and speaking? Well, at that time, a man came into his life, a speech therapist by the name of Lionel Logue. Lionel Logue became a friend to Bertie, as he was called, King George VI. He encouraged him. He coached him. He helped him to, to overcome his handicap. And even though he would never be able to completely overcome it, it he helped him to continue to, uh, to, to lead even when he was struggling with this. I love that story because it reminds us of the awesome importance of parenting. That King George VI was able to overcome, but he shouldn't have to overcome a, a difficult parenting upbringing. But thankfully, he had Lionel Logue there, standing at his side, encouraging him and coaching him in the most important hour of his life. And we learn from his story, but more importantly, we learn from Timothy's story what it takes for a, a person to be able to grow up in a setting where they understand God's calling upon their lives and are ready to step in to that calling, whatever it may be. So what is it that our boys need? Well, first of all, they need leadership. They need leadership. Acts 16.1 says that when Paul came to Lystra, that he found this disciple named Timothy, a disciple. He was a follower of Jesus. So apparently, somebody had invested in Timothy's life to help him to come to a place where he put his trust in Jesus and began to follow Jesus Christ. But listen, disciples are made, not born. And so this was not just a one-time decision that Timothy made, but it was a, a lifelong process of growing to learn to follow Jesus. And one of the things we learn about Timothy's life is that this first started with the female figures in his life. The female figures in his life were the most prominent ones early on. It says that in, in Acts 16, 1, that Timothy's mother was a Jewish woman. A Jewish woman who was also a believer. So she was Jewish. She had a cultural religion, but it was more than that for her. It was a convictional faith that she possessed. She was a believer. She had put her trust in Jesus as the Lord and Savior uh, of her life. Listen, we can't 
pass on to our children what we don't possess ourselves. And so we know that this woman's name is Eunice, and, uh, and she passed her faith along to her son. But it wasn't just uh, Timothy's mother. We also know that his grandmother was involved. We read earlier, verse 5, Paul says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. These wonderful female figures in his life that helped him to take his place in God's great kingdom purposes. Notice that their faith lived in them. That word lived means to dwell in. It wasn't a, it's, it's, it's not a surface, shallow kind of faith. It's a very deep, solid faith that they had. And, and it wasn't just the mother, it was also the grandmother their, their faith was so strong that it rolled along like a tsunami wave affecting generation after generation. It has to live in us first before it lives in our children. And a part of this faith that is passed along was, was uh, their, their, their knowledge of and love for the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 15. In my Bible, I could just look across the page to verse 15 where Paul says, from infancy... You have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So presumably, this faith that lived in Timothy was a result of of the word of God that had been embedded in his life by his mother and his grandmother. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so as we are careful to open the Word of God and read the Word of God and help our children learn to read the Word of God and to talk about it and to apply it uh, in our lives and help them to know how it applies in their lives, that this is what the Holy Spirit uses to awaken faith, which leads, first of all, to salvation, but then also to, to living the life of the gospel all of their lives. Oh, how important it is for us to, to embed the Word of God into the lives of our children. We can't live, it can't live in our children until it lives in us. But also notice the male figures in his life. Acts 16, 1 says that his father uh, was a Greek. That's all we know about him, that he was a Greek. Apparently, he was a non-factor in Timothy's life, spiritually speaking. And that's sad Because one of the things that boys need is they need from their dads a strong faith that is passed to them. And Timothy didn't have that. Apparently his biological father failed him at this point. But thankfully he has a spiritual father, the Apostle Paul. Who, uh, who, who steps into his life in a very important season of his life. We said earlier, we saw earlier how Paul refers to him here in verse 2 as my dear son. He's, he's a spiritual son. He later in other places will call him my son in the faith. And how important those male figures are along with the female figures. You know, church, we live in a time when there is so much confusion about gender issues. I mean, we're just getting hit in the face with it constantly now. If you follow the, uh, the sad story of Bruce Jenner, now Caitlyn Jenner, and what in the world are we to think about this as believers? Well, church, I just want to remind us today that we have the opportunity to model and to proclaim the good, glorious, creative purposes of God. Genesis says that he created them male and female. Married, children come from that union, and the children benefit from a male and a female influence, the the, the influence of a godly father and a godly mom in their lives. And I'm going to tell you something. Sooner or later, our culture is going to wake up to the hideous direction that it's going. And they're going to see that it isn't working. And and, and as the people of God, we have the opportunity to keep that example before of what marriage should be, what parenting should be, because I tell you, the the way of the world now is going to to come back to roost and people are going to start looking for better answers 
And we know we have them in the Word of God. So how important it is for us as the church to hold up this wonderful standard of of a husband and a wife and a mom and a dad, a godly mom and a godly dad who will produce godly offspring. They need both men and women factors and figures in their life. So as a result of the, the impact of these godly people, Timothy became a disciple and grew as a disciple. And I want to just say how thankful I am for, for hundreds of you who are going to work in Vacation Bible School this coming week and, and the opportunity that you have to come alongside boys and girls and to teach them what it means to follow Jesus and to be saved and to follow Jesus all the rest of their life. So boys need leadership, as do girls. But also we, we learn from this text that uh, boys need affirmation. They need affirmation. Uh, in, in, in verse 3, Paul says, Timothy, I, I, I thank God for you. I thank God for you, young man. Now, it's very important. It's not just about building the self-esteem of children. Children need to have a God esteem before they have a self-esteem. They need to know that the most important thing in life is not what other people think about them, even their parents. That the first thing and the most important thing is what God thinks about them. Paul says, Timothy, I thank God for you. What he's saying there is, God is good. God is good. And he has blessed us with you, and he's blessed us through you. You know, it's sad that there are many grown men who are walking around today that never had any affirmation. They're hurting because they never got any affirmation or encouragement from their dads. But I want to say it's not too late to do that. It's not too late for you men, grandfathers, to say to your grown son, son, I may have never told you this, but I thank God for you. I love you. They need to hear that, that affirmation. But also, boys need prayer. They need prayer. Now, I know that's an understatement. But Paul says it here in verse 3. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I was thinking about that, night and day. How often our most serious praying happens at night, doesn't it? It's when we are lying there in the dark and thinking about all of the dangers and the perils that our kids are facing. And so Paul says, night and day, I remember you all the time, constantly, I'm praying for you. Listen, when we pray for our kids, and I'm not talking about just say, God bless them. We are fervently down on our knees, maybe on our faces before God, praying and claiming the promises of God for our children. We are releasing the great blessings of God into their lives. So we need to pray for our kids. We need to pray with our children. Boys need that, but they also need affection. That's the next thing. They need affection. Now, I know that may say seem odd that boys need affection. You know, there was previous generations really didn't didn't, uh, take that seriously. The thought was that you have to toughen them up so you slug them rather than hug them. And we laugh about it, but really that was the the mindset of of many in previous generations. I don't see that in the Word of God. But I see here, there's no probably no greater man in the in in the Bible, human man, aside from the Lord Jesus Christ, than the Apostle Paul. That boy went through some terrible difficulties. You talk about a man of courage. He was a man's man. He had to to endure what he endured. But he was tough, but he was also tender. And he shows this tender side when he speaks to Timothy in verse 4. He says, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. This tender, affectionate sentence. Apparently, when Paul and Timothy had last been together, they parted ways. Timothy was weeping. And Paul says, Timothy, I I, I can't wait to see you because seeing you is going to fill my heart with such joy. Yes, yes. Kids need to hear us say that. Don't just presume that they know it. And you know, physical and emotional harshness creates fearful children. 
Let me say that again. Physical and emotional harshness or abuse creates fearful children. Just think about King George VI. He was thrust into a position of world leadership, but absolutely afraid because of, of his upbringing. And there's some indication that, the, that, that Timothy had a fearful side to him. And, uh, and, and so Paul is there to, to, to show genuine affection and compassion for Timothy, to assure him that God is strong in his life. They need affection. But also, boys need a sense of calling. They need a sense of calling. Now, verse 6 says, for this reason... I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. I'll just explain what this is. Paul had helped Timothy to find his place and to fulfill his calling in God's great kingdom purposes in the gospel. When Paul first came to Lystra, he saw potential in Timothy. And he said, Timothy, I want you to go with me. And somewhere, whether it was in the church at Lystra or one of the other churches, Paul and the other elders recognized God's calling upon Timothy's life, the giftedness that God had given to him. And and so they set him apart, or as we would say, they ordained him. Someone preached, prophesied over him, according to 1 Timothy 4. Someone prophesied over him and exhorted him to take his place and to fulfill the calling of God upon his life. And then Paul says, we laid hands on you. We prayed over you. And there was nothing magical about the laying on of hands. It was just their conviction that, that, that Timothy needed the grace of God to fulfill the calling, the giftedness that God had given to him. And, he said, and, and so he says, fan it in the flame, man. Don't, don't let it just sit dormant. What, what a cheerleader Paul was for his spiritual son, Timothy. They need a sense of calling, but they also need a sense of courage. They need a sense of courage. I will say that as we think about the next generation, it's not going to be enough for us as parents and grandparents to simply try to help our kids get a good education and go out and make a lot of money and have nice things and live the good life. If that's the kind of young people that our churches are, are producing, then the hope for the gospel is bleak. But I believe that God has greater things in store for us. That as we help our boys and girls become young men and young women, and some of them will be preachers and missionaries officially speaking. But all of them need to be made to understand that whether they choose the profession of a school teacher or a businessman or a pastor or pastor's wife or whatever it is that they feel God leading them to do, that they are to do it to fulfill God's kingdom's purposes, not just to go out there and make a living and have the good life. Listen, the days are short, and we need to release a generation of young people who have that passion about them. And I'm excited that I see that in a lot of our young people today. And we need to be their greatest cheerleaders. They're going to need courage. Imagine what would happen if these words were read and spoken over every child's life. Verse 7. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. What if you read that verse over your infants and when they get to be older? Do not be ashamed to be a witness for Jesus. Or don't be ashamed of me as a prisoner of other people who are faithful to Jesus. But join with me in suffering for the gospel. What if we said that to the next generation? Don't be afraid to suffer for the gospel. By the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus. Church, 
That is gospel parenting. And that may not be what we've been taught to do as parents, but it's gospel parenting. And I wish I'd have learned this earlier. But church, Christ has called us to not only be saved, but to live a holy life and to convey that living faith to our next generations. I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me, please. Father, I pray this morning that you would give us a vision of what could happen if we began to see parenting through the eyes of the gospel. What kind of young people could be unleashed on this world for your great kingdom's purposes? Lord, I pray that as grandparents and parents, we will get serious about praying for our kids and our grandkids. Not that they would be happy and healthy, but that, God, they would be holy and take their place in your great kingdom's purposes, Lord, because ultimately, that's really what life is. Jesus said you want to gain life, you got to lose it. If you try to keep your life, you're going to, you're going to forfeit it. So, Lord, I pray that you would give us grace for the task. In Jesus' name. I want us to stand together this morning as we, as we worship. Maybe you realize that you don't have a faith to pass to your kids or your grandkids, and you realize this is, this is serious business. I need Christ. As we sing together today, the gospel is that Christ died for us and gave us new life, not by anything we did, but by everything that he did in our behalf. We put our trust in him. You'll become a follower of Jesus just like Timothy did. Or maybe you want to link your life with our church. Or perhaps your heart is just so burdened for your kids and grandkids. You want to come and just kneel here at this altar. As we pray together and sing now, you respond.